Well, hello, VEST scholars, and welcome to Module 6. In our little video today, we're going to talk about climate variability. Uh, this is a really big topic and a very complex one, and I'm only going to scratch the surface, so please do be sure that you look at the uh, extra resources given to you because there's a lot of really good information in there as well. There's also a lot of websites out there. Um, among environmental scientists and earth geo geosystem scientists, climate change is probably, uh, next to population growth, the single biggest challenge that humanity faces uh, for many of them. So uh, I have a picture here uh, of an example of evidence for climate change, and that is that uh, the, the retreat of Helheim Glacier in Greenland, one of hundreds of glaciers, if not thousands of glaciers around the world, including um, those are just a valley glacier here, but ice sheets and things that are also retreating. Uh, but here you can see just four years of retreat. So it's just an example. I don't have a scale on here, but uh, it's a fairly large amount of uh, distance in the course of four years. So let's look at this issue. Um, at least give it a broad brush. So there's, a, there's, some, there's some terms that need to be ironed out first, of course. Uh, what is climate? Climate is simply the long-term average of temperature, precipitation, and other meteorological factors for a given location or region. Now, global climate, of course, is where you take the averages of all these regions and factor them in to a global average for these things. And, of course, that's looking at, at climate as a dynamic equilibrium or as a, at an equilibrium sort of, sort of, uh, sort of situation. Uh, now, change in that climate is uh, simply a positive or negative uh, from that normal or that average. So we can start getting into a so sort of a statistical discussion in some respects when we get into this. Now, in terms of systems, you guys have been dealing with Earth systems for the entire uh, VES program, and some interesting or some important definitions to re to go over again are uh, when it comes to systems, the concept of dynamic equilibrium is important, and that uh, all systems are constantly in a state of dynamic equilibrium where things, small perturbations occur, and then the system re returns to a state of equilibrium relatively easily. Uh, and so a good example of this is a, per, is a balanced budget where every month the money comes in, the money goes out, but you stay positive and generally the money doesn't increase in your, in your account. You're just kind of going in and out with, uh, with income and, and, uh, and expenditures. Then there's things called forcings. Suddenly you need that big car repair and you have to come up with extra money. And maybe you have to take out a loan to do it. Maybe it, it unbalances your budget is the bottom line. And it's a primary forcing mechanism that changes the equilibrium. Now, you can, re you can return to that dynamic e equilibrium. But that forcing can sometimes lead to either positive or negative feedbacks that either accentuate the problem. In this case, the loss of money and the extended or the in increased loss of money in your bank account or help the problem. Um, ironically, the positive feedback in this case is the one that's actually making the problem more accentuated. And uh, in other words, making your, your issue of money more difficult and a negative feedback would be helping the situation. And I give a couple examples here. For instance, the negative feedback that when you go get your that big repair done, it leads to uh, connections maybe with somebody in the waiting room that ends up uh, helping your business out and you end up... Uh, getting a lot of income from it, and so that ends up being a negative feedback, taking you further taking you further into better place in your banking account, but while you're dealing with this other this, this original forcing. So these are secondary things, feedbacks. Um, of course, we've, we've talked about these before. As energy comes into the earth, their, um, you know, energy is absorbed or reflected, basically back into space or up back into the atmosphere where it's again absorbed or reflected back. Regardless, the, the, in, the incoming radiation comes into shortwave radiation, and some of it's reflected by ice and snow cover. As the troposphere warms, the ice and snow cover decreases, and this white surface area on the surface is diminished. The dark ocean is in, and land is increased, and that is an example of a positive feedback into the warming of the climate system. If you can make the ice sheets bigger, you can actually cause a negative feedback, but the other way to do it is to is to spew sulfur dioxide compounds, for instance, or sulfur compounds into the into the atmosphere, um, the stratosphere. Actually, you put them up in the stratosphere, and that's one of the geoengineering solutions to climate change is to is to do that. It's not a very great alternative, but there are, of course, it's been proposed. But anyway, we've talked about these before. There's positive and negative feedbacks to uh, to the climate, including 
the air sea exchange, biogeochemical processes, uh, the permafrost decomposition, and so on and so forth. Some of these occur um, on a very short period. Others appear, occur on a very long uh, time span, which leads us into the carbon cycle. Really, the biogeochemical cycles are the basic foundation of climate variability because the fact that we have a warm, a warm surface that where liquid water can exist is because of the greenhouse effect and the presence of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. They're extremely important to have. And so, you know, having a 280 to 300 part per million uh, CO2 concentration is pretty much what life has been like for the last 10,000 years, and actually the last 800,000 years. Uh, and that's led to, well, the last 10,000 years led to relative climatic stability. Uh, we've had big ice age fluctuations over the over time prior to that. But as the carbon is exchanged, of course, carbon doesn't just sit in the atmosphere. It gets pulled in by various things. Uh, plants respire, uh, which brings in, of course, CO2 and releases oxygen. Uh, they sequester that, that biomass into the soil. The soil accumulates carbon. Uh, and then, of course, plants eventually become in the right conditions, uh, swamps and stuff, it can eventually become coal deposits, uh, or in the case of ocean, become ocean sediments and become limestones. And these are these are examples of the long or the slow carbon cycle. So when you're pre when you're creating cement or burning coal, you're taking materials from the slow carbon cycle and adding them to the fast carbon cycle, which is the part with respiration and the ga air sea gas exchange. And suddenly now you're uh, you're adding to the fast carbon cycle carbon that wasn't there before. And so you've perturbed the carbon cycle. And that's exactly what human emissions are doing here, is they're taking from the, from the slow carbon cycle with fossil fuels, cement production, and so forth, um, and even you know deforestation and whatnot, and then adding to uh, that slow carbon cycle carbon to the fast carbon cycle, and therefore increasing the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere in the form of methane or CO2, as well as nitrogen uh, you know, NOx, NOx gases and so forth and, and so forth, we'll get, which we'll get to later. So understanding the carbon cycle as it has been in a dyna dynamic equilibrium, equilibrium since before at least the Industrial Revolution, uh, it's important to understand that that equilibrium has been perturbed and that's the, 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 the sort of undergirding behind anthropogenic climate change. And here's a great video um, produced by NASA uh, that basically kind of goes over this. And I'm going to turn the volume off briefly, but um, to play it. But basically, you can see what CO2 does during the course of a year, and you can see during the the industrial uh, parts of Europe and Asia and North America, the significantly increased CO2 concentrations. And this is in January. Uh, generally, in the winter, CO2 in the atmosphere is much has a much higher concentration than it does in the summer, and you can imagine because there's fewer leaves in the in the temperate latitudes during the uh, during the winter, and so you can see the concentration really building up as we move into February and March. Then, as we I'm going to fast forward here a little bit, as we get into um, summer, we look at it. It really builds up there in, in May. By by May, you have really really intense um, concentrations of carbon over these areas. But you can see it's starting to diminish during the summer. Um, there's some degree of uh, biogenic uptake going on. And by the time we get to June and July, the CO2 in the atmosphere is not nearly as intense, although we're still producing it, clearly, um, in, in very industrially intense areas. But you start getting to late August and uh, eventually into um, September and October when the leaves are falling off the trees now, and the CO2 concentrations, again, go back to their annual winter uh, maxima. Uh, and over time, of course, these concentrations continue to go up annually so that even during the summer the concentration is higher than average every year and we're monitoring monitoring this uh, in a number of places but especially with Mauna Loa uh, and where we're constantly monitoring that so let's take a moment and look at the current state of the climate and NASA has a great website for this uh, climate.nasa.gov I'm going to go through and give you a broad brush I'd suggest you spend some time here but you can see uh, the, the first article on this front page is actually a really great one uh, and it's talking about how January 2017 is the third warmest on record. In fact, 2016, the entire year, was the third warmest on record. You can see some places are seeing um, anomalously low temperatures. But look at North America and the Arctic, anomalously warm temperatures. Uh, and that's from, for 
all of you folks here in Virginia, that's what you've been experiencing. Uh, and so, but you can see here, there's some great little vital signs for the planet here. Carbon dioxide's at above 400 ppm now constantly. Uh, global temperatures are up, are up 1.7 degrees since 1880 on average. Again, these are global climate averages. Uh, Arctic ice minimum is down 13.3% over the course of the last decade. And then the amount of land ice is down a significant amount, 281 gigatons per year. We're losing. And then sea level has gone up 3.4 millimeters per year. The key ones here, of course, are CO2 and global temperature, uh, especially as it relates back to the carbon cycle. So if we look at this, this is as monitored at the Mauna Loa station in Hawaii. And, uh, and you can see that over the course of uh, this span of time from two, about 2005 to 2016, there's a steady march upward. And really, this march upward continues on back into the late 60s. And uh, it's sometimes called the, Keel, it's called the Keeling Curve. But you can see there's an up and down. But over the up and downs, the annual up and downs, of course, that come with photosynthesis and so forth, seasonal, uh, overall, there's an, there's an increasing average upward. So there's a lot more to read about here, and you can go to the full vital sign, but as that CO2 keeps going up, we're going to go look at temperature now, and know that there is a direct relationship between CO2 concentration and temperature. Now, this is since 1880 in this case, but if we look at 2005 through, um, 2000, through the, current, the current time, you can see it's also on a completely upward trend. There's a, a flattening out here of sorts, but um, overall, the, the trend is very much upward. And... Over the course of the last 50 years, especially, uh, it's been going up significantly. But if we could, we could take this back even further and note that it's gone back. Um, it's been going up significantly since then. And um, we can do that, actually, by looking at this, some of these next things we'll get to in a moment. So natural forcings. Here's, here's the graph I was looking for. So over the last, here's our current. CO2 concentrations in parts per million over the course of the last 400,000 years. Here's where things are currently, and this is the line above which things never went in terms of concentration of CO2 in the last 400,000 years. I could extend this back to the last 800,000 years, and it's the same story. Uh, 1950, things really ramp up. So, you know, normally we'd be coming out of, a, out of an ice age uh, right about now due to natural climate climatic variability. But the concentrations that are up there now and the current temperatures are so far out, uh, so far beyond the normal that uh, we have to look at two questions. Is it a natural variability we're looking at that is driving the climate up so up so intensely? Or are we just are, are we seeing human driven climate change? But no one really disputes, of course, that the temperature is warming. The big question comes down to how much of it is caused by humans and then what do we do about it if it is? You can see that over time, since the beginning of the Earth's, uh, uh, Earth's existence, uh, and this is looking at mean global temperatures, you can see there have been plenty of fluctuations. And overall, we're in a relatively cold spell on the Earth in the present day. Uh, but we're heading back towards a warm spell. But, you know, of course, the atmosphere has changed over time. Life has changed over time. There's a lot to this story in through here. And, of course, the Mesozoic era is often thought of as, as a really warm period, as well as the Eocene. Uh, we go back to the uh, the beginning of the Earth when, uh, during you know, the great oxygenation event, when oxygen began to be poured into the atmosphere and CO2 levels began to come down, that began to eventually cool the temperatures. We went through some significant ice ages during the global glaciation, sometimes referred to as snowball Earth events here, as the Earth's dynamic equilibrium was upset, and it overshot, went past the tipping point, and the whole globe glaciated. We, you know, that's the essence of the evidence suggests actually three times, um, two, certainly possibly three times. And we call those snowball earth events. Um, anyway, these are some major climatic shifts over time. A lot of them are related to paleogeographic changes as well. There's a lot of factors involved here, but um, CO2 is a major driver. It's not the only driver, but it, oh, the course of, of, uh, of Earth's history, but right now it's the major driver. So we can go back and look at, of course, uh, there is a bit of cycl cyclicity to climate change over the last 800,000 years, in this case, 650,000 years, looking down here. Here's CO2 concentrations, again, not generally going above 290 parts per million, 
even during interglacial periods where we have these yellow areas, these blue areas are the glacial periods, and you can see they have a relatively uniform periodicity. And no, there's no humans really doing much back, and the population is low. There have been some fires here and there, but overall, there's not much that humans are doing to cause glaciations or not. And so we have to look towards natural variability to explain patterns like this. And natural variability is, well, the natural explanation for patterns like this. So we look at things called Milankovitch forcings. There's three ways that the Earth's orbit changes that can affect climate over time. One of these is called eccentricity. It has a 100,000 year cycle, and it's basically when the Earth's orbit changes from uh, more circular to more elliptical. It takes 100,000 years for it to go through that cycle. And generally that, if you look and compare this cycle, look at all the peaks, and then compare the CO2 spikes, you can kind of pretty much see that there's a connection between uh, eccentricity and the big glacial, the glacial period. You can go back here and notice that, you know, here's this one starts at about oh, 330,000 years ago and ends about uh, 280,000 years ago. Well, actually, the whole cycle ends about 230,000 years. So there's your 100,000 year cycle right there. Intergla er, interglacial, glacial, 100,000 years. Eccentricity is, is, is likely the big driver there. In the midst of that, there's also these smaller signals. One is obliquity, which is the change in the Earth's tilt from about 21.5 to 24.5 degrees. Right now it's at 23.5 degrees. It takes about 41,000 years to make it through an, an entire cycle. And then there's the precession cycle, which is the wobble of the Earth's axis, which is akin to if you spin a top and it begins to slow down, the axis of the top begins to wobble around in a circle. That's what you're seeing here. It's the reason Polaris is the North Star, but it won't always be the North Star, and it hasn't always been the North Star, because that just happens to be where the Earth's axis is pointing now. Those signals are a little more difficult to pick out, but you can admit, you can you can look at these at the data here uh, for CO2 and other thing and temperature. Here's a temperature proxy, and begin to pick those things out as well. So clearly, Milankovitch cycles, changes in the Earth's orbit, do have an effect on the Earth's climate. Another thing that has an effect on the, effect on the Earth's climate uh, towards the towards warmth and cold are sunspot cycles. And of course, when the sun has more sunspots, it's actually emitting a uh, more insulation. It's actually insulation actually goes up than it, than when it has fewer sunspots. And this is an eleven year cycle. And of course, there's a larger sort of um, pulsation to the cycle. You can kind of see here as well. There's a period here, the Maunder Minimum, which is sometimes referred to as the Little Ice Age in Europe. Uh, it's, there's a debate over, the, over whether this is actually a global phenomenon or not. But there's a lot we don't know about it, but this is the time of the Little Ice Age. This is the time right about over here where the Greenland colonies uh, became too cold and, and most that either were abandoned or people who were living there uh, died. But again, Little Ice Age, and then of course, which had a significant uh, effect on, on history. This is also the time when North America is being heavily colonized by the British, uh, the English, and the Dutch, and so forth, right about over here. And Native American populations are beginning to be decimated. So there's a lot of interesting things going on in history during the beginning of the Little Ice Age and through that throughout its time span. Another way that climate can be altered is actually in terms of cooling. So here we have a volcanic eruption that has released a bunch of sulfur dioxides into the atmosphere right about here. And that actually increases the albedo in the upper atmosphere, reflecting more sunlight into space and leading to cooler temperatures. Now, of course, that is a very temporary thing on the, in this case, in this eruption on the course of a 10 year span. And then it returns to normal. But nevertheless, it is a cooling uh, cycle. So here, this is a relatively, uh, these cycles will be relatively rapid warming and cooling in the course of maybe decades or hundreds of years. Here's this, here, this is in like tens of years. Uh, and then the Milankovitch cycles are in thousands of years or hundreds of thousands of years. The trouble is that uh, the current warming cannot be fully explained or even or even explained at all with natural forcings. There are no natural forcings that can explain the rapid rise in CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. The only way that's been explainable is through anthropogenic contributions. These contributions include, and this is from the IPCC report, uh, include deforestation and burning of Russian peat, transportation, factories, energy production from coal and natural gas, and agriculture. Uh, in this case, we're talking about methane, and in the case of fertilizer, we're talking about NOx, uh, you know, nitrogen compounds, 
which you know, are a greenhouse gas. You can see down here our, uh, our greenhouse gases in this case, the N2Os, the methanes, and, the, uh, and so forth. Uh, but those have been going up since 1970 precipitously. And while they've been going up, temperature has also been going up. So that's a very significant uh, correlation there. Now, we tend to like to, you know, one of the important things in science is modeling, uh, modeling the effects of, uh, well, modeling changes, essentially. And, of course, with climate modeling, it's extraordinarily complex because there's so many variables. But um, Climate Interactive is a great place to go and um, check out as well. Um, apart from NASA resources, they, do, they spend a lot of time doing modeling there, and there's some great modeling activities uh, you can do on your own. But um, these are the various scenarios uh, put together back when the Paris talks were occurring uh, in 2015. And under NOAC, the no-action scenario, the prediction was by 2100, 4.5 degrees centigrade increase globally in temperature, about 8 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the current INDCs, which are the intended, national, uh, deter intended nationally determined contributions um, but from each country, if those actually happened and countries did those things, it would limit it to 3.5 degrees Celsius um, from, their est from their models. Uh, the, what their argument is that a 2 degree pathway is necessary uh, to really stave off the really um, difficult aspects of climate change. But that currently, what the what global, what the United Nations and the IPCC and the Paris talks um, are looking at is nowhere near what's what's enough. But again, these are models. So the challenge, of course, with models is that you're doing the best you can to model reality, but reality isn't always easily modeled. So of course, they have their problems, and as we gain more information, we begin to adjust those problems, or you know, and address address those problems and make adjustments. Um, but generally, of course, the Paris talks were, were pretty successful, and uh, there's hope that the international community can come together. Uh, it's not quite on the level of the Montreal Protocol for ozone, but we're moving in the right direction. Uh, why, would we, why would we even be concerned? I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this chart. It's in your um, extra materials. I would encourage you to spend time there. And if you really want to get into it, go into the IPCC reports, which are easily discovered online. Uh, but these are some of the things going on in the cryosphere, in the ocean, in the forest. There are other places where climate effects are going to be occurring. But just to take you through one, here we have to note the major, uh, the attribution of climate change role. Uh, solid arrows are major, dashed arrows are minor. Okay. And so, uh, thinking about um, in the cryosphere, land surface warming leads to uh, directly to decreased spring snowpack. And then uh, an early spring peak, a peak flow of water discharge in the western U.S. And, of course, decreasing spring snowpack also means decreasing winter snowpack, which is a big problem for uh, uh, the flow of water in the summer. This inevitably leads to um, more intense summer droughts, such as what California has been dealing with the last seven or eight years, up until the big rains this uh, winter, but it remains to be seen what happens with those, um, and so forth. So... We could go through this and spend, but these are all potentially human-caused effects um, of the warming. So these are the effects of the warming, and of course, what I'm getting at, if humans are the main forcing mechanism for this warming, then we have to ask ourselves, well, how do we address this? And how do we prevent these things from happening? Now, so, in order to do that, um, well, I'll get to that in a second. One of the uh, interesting little side notes here uh, is that we talk about this concept of the Anthropocene. And um, humans, of course, we know have an effect on, on, on the climate, but they also have an effect on biodiversity, uh, ocean acidification, sea level rise, and so forth. Um, and so one of the questions, if we're talking about humans as a force of nature, a forcing within nature, and all these different realms, when did we become an influence? So that's one of the big debates that's going on right now um, amidst the scientific community is this concept of... of a new geologic epoch called the Anthropocene. Whether it ends up being a geologic epoch or not, the conversation is important. In order for it to be a geologic epoch, you have to be able to place what's called a global stratotype section and point. You've got to be able to have something that's in the rock record, preservable globally, that you can point to and say, there's the beginning of the Anthropocene. And we may not find that for the Anthropocene, but the conversation is important. The big debate, of course, is when do you place that GSSP? At one point in history, 
Does it go back just to the Industrial Revolution? Does it go back to the Nuclear Age, the Great Acceleration, and so forth? Or do you go all the way back to the, almost the beginning of the Holocene, as Rudiman would argue, who is a professor at UVA, where he's arguing that, he are, in his argument, the Rudiman hypothesis, uh, we should have been going back into a glacial period as, C, as CH4 and CO2 are decreasing after the start of the Holocene, but that the nascent agricultural revolution and the deforestation and stuff that went along with that was enough about eight, 9,000 years ago to prevent that from happening and to put enough CO2 in the atmosphere to uh, keep us from going back into an ice age. And then coupled with uh, pastoralism later on, or at least the, the uh, uh, you know, animal husbandry associated with cattle and sheep and whatnot, um, became more prevalent enough to pre prevent methane from, from going on a downward, uh, along this downward trend here, and then leading back into uh, a, a cooler climate. And thus you have the observed climate versus where he, where he would argue we should have been going. So this debate's going on. It's a big debate. Uh, amongst the scientific community, the debate over whether humans are causing climate change or not is largely on the side of, yes, we are, and it's a significant effect. Uh, exactly how long we've been causing the problem or causing those problems or those forcing is another, is another question altogether. But, and that's where this comes in. But when we think about this, we think about, um, you know, how do we change this? How do we affect our behavior? Uh, and what, it is, what is it we're looking at? So we talk about events like sea level rise and the warming and so forth. But again, those are events. Those are, those are reactions or responses to stuff that's going on. And that stuff, of course, are behavioral patterns and systemic structures that are um, essentially supporting these events happening. And below that are the mindsets, the things that, uh, you know, in terms of what we do with our, our thinking. How do we think differently to produce sustainable structures that can lead to uh, a, a diminishing of climate, the climate responses uh, to human behavior? And this is what this iceberg model is really getting at. The stuff you see in the impacts are uh, just the tip of the iceberg, but they uh, underlying them eventually down here are the, the mindsets that, that support all of that. In the end, it's us and what we, how, we, how we think about the world and how we react with the world that's important. And so these are the things that we as a society need to address, and, and some are and um, some are not so much. But uh, that's an important thing for you to be thinking about as you work through this material. All right, with that, we are at the end of our uh, presentation. I hope you've gotten a lot out of this, and uh, enjoy Module 6.